All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, just so you know, I'm not just randomly talking into a microphone that's off. It's for the uh, camera back there. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm Maddie. I'm one of the naturalists this winter. And what? Hi. <laughs> and it's great to see everyone here. Welcome to the fifth installment of our Naturalist Night series. So this is a 10-week free speaker series in the Roaring Fork Valley hosted by a partnership between Wilderness Workshop, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, or ACES, and the Roaring Fork on the Tables and Counter after the presentation. We have talks hosted each week through mid-March in Carbondale at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays and here at ACES at Hallam Lake at 6 p.m. on Thursdays. I also want to thank our wonderful sponsors including tonight's featured sponsor, Ken's, Ken Ransford, excuse me, PC. And these businesses provide financial and in-kind donations with, which cover travel expenses for our speakers and the cost of having Grassroots TV video the presentations. And that makes our Naturalist Nights possible. So thank you so much to those guys. Uh, another note on Grassroots TV, they air their presentation on Channel 12 Up Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley. The videos will also be available on our organization's website, so at ACES, and social media feeds in the coming week. We also live stream the Naturalist Night speakers on either Wednesday or Thursday evening on both Wilderness Workshop and the ACES Facebook page. So just a note on what's coming up. Next week's presentation is going to be Dr. Kate Schoenecker with Feral Horses in Western USA, Politics, Controversy, and Science. So that should be great, and that's coming up next. And lastly, to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Joanna Varner, or Pika Joe. She is an <laughs> assistant professor of biology at Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction. She's been studying pikas for about the last 10 years in habitats all the way from Oregon to southwest Colorado. She's also developed quite a few citizen science programs to engage local residents in monitoring these cute and charismatic little critters. She's now one of Colorado's leading pika experts, but she's also had past lives as an engineer, a bakery manager, a plum farmer, and a ski bum, so maybe ask her about those things at some point. <laughs> in her spare time, she loves to brew beer, ski, and trail run with her dogs in the mountains and in the desert. So please join me in welcoming Pika Joe to our Naturalist Nights. All right. Um. Well, this was working earlier, but I'm getting, <laughs> do you guys see my pointer? Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for coming, braving the, the winter weather tonight to come and, and listen to me talk about pikas. And um, I just wanted to say a special thanks to ACES and to Andrea and Jim for inviting me here. This has been a really fabulous experience. Um, I'm really excited to tell you guys a little bit about my pika research. Um, most of what I'm going to tell you guys about tonight is work that I did in the Pacific Northwest as part of my PhD dissertation. But wherever possible, I'm going to try to sort of update you with some of the things that I'm doing now here in Colorado and um, different ways that you guys can get involved yourselves. So step one, turn the advancer on. There we go. Um, <laughs> there are many signs that our world is changing. And here in the Roaring Fort Valley, the, the um, aspects of climate change that you guys are probably most familiar with are rising temperatures and reduced snow and ice features. So we're seeing overall um, less winter snowpack and it's lasting uh, for a shorter period of time on average. Um, plants and animals are also responding to these changes. This is a small sampling of some of the different species that have had documented um, changes in their distribution or abundance as a result of climate change. Um, one of them that you guys may not have known about is a national treasure. Um, climate change actually threatens a number of uh, small bunny species. And of course, we'll be talking about pikas tonight. So there are lots of people who are really interested in sort of climate forecasting and trying to predict these changes in temperature and precipitation. But as an ecologist, I'm really interested in a different kind of forecasting, which is ecological forecasting. And one of the central questions that I am interested in is how plants and animals are going to you know, be distributed in the future and what kinds of habitats will be suitable for them under different environmental conditions. 
One of the um, tools that we use to predict this sort of thing is a tool that's called a niche model. So the word niche refers to uh, the preferred range of, of abiotic factors or environmental factors that a species you know, can persist under. And the way that these models work uh, is that we start with a set of known occurrences. So this is a made up example of a species in California. And we overlay those known occurrences with different kinds of layers of known environmental factors. So these could be things like humidity, temperature, precipitation, um, even light intensity, things like this. We can then use a computer model to basically pr produce a map of predicted habitat suitability, um, given where the species is currently occurs and all of these abiotic factors. And so we can see areas here in red that would represent areas of high suitability. Over here in the Mojave Desert, th this would represent an area of sort of low suitability. And then since we have um, pretty good predictions of how some of these abiotic factors are going to change in the future, we can then ask the model to predict um, what the habitat suitability is going to be in the future for our species, given the changes in the environment. And this would allow us to identify areas of range expansion. So this would be places where the species was not previously present, but now can move into, and areas of range retraction. So places that were previously suitable, but may not be in the future. Now, these kinds of niche models tend to be really good with abiotic factors. So they tend to be really good with environmental factors like temperature and precipitation. And if that were the whole story, then I would be out of a job. <laughs> but the, it turns out that ecology is a lot more complex than just temperature and precipitation. And niche models are oftentimes uh, don't do as good of a job at predicting how different changes in distributions will affect species interactions. So this could be what you eat, who eats you, um, even your gut microbes or um, parasites. They don't handle microclimate very well. So microclimate, this is sort of an area where the local conditions are sort of you know, different from the overall ambient conditions. Um, these could be places where there's a lot of shade that produces a cooler area, uh, evaporative cooling, or even rock ice features that can produce locally cooler microclimates. Um, they also don't work quite as well with things like animal behavior and the ways that animals are able to change their behavior in response to changes in environmental factors. So this leaves us, <laughs> this is an actual picture of a, um, a sign in Sauce Face, Switzerland, <laughs> just so you guys know. I didn't make this up, but hold on to your hats. Um, so this leaves us with the persistent question of how we can identify habitats that are going to be suitable under future um, climate change and, and that will serve as a refuge for, for different kinds of, of species. They t these t kinds of refuges tend to be pockety and they tend to be sort of difficult to identify because they're areas where the local climate is really different from the overall climate. Um, and one of the things I'm going to argue for you guys tonight is that we can actually learn quite a lot by studying how species persist in an atypical habitat. So if we could learn how something is able to survive in a climate that seems totally unsuitable for them, like marmots having a beach party, um, we might be able to, to better understand um, how the, the kinds of habitat features that are really important for the species to survive elsewhere in times of an unfavorable climate. So I just want to also just take a moment to let you guys know I made this <laughs> slide <laughs> for like an actual scientific presentation. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> it's one of my prouder accomplishments. All right. So this is an outline of the things that I'm going to tell you guys about tonight. I'm going to start by giving you guys a little bit of background about American pikas, in case you don't know about them, and talk about sort of how they've garnered a reputation for being sort of can canaries in the coal mine of climate change. I'm then going to tell you a little bit about pikas living in atypical habitats, and we're going to focus on some low elevation habitats in the Pacific Northwest and those that have been disturbed by a wildfire. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about how we can improve ecological forecasting for climate change and then also improving public interfacing about climate change, um, specifically through citizen science. So American pikas, if you don't know what they are yet, um, they are small mammals in the lagomorph order, which means that they're closely related to rabbits and hares. Um, interestingly, they are the only lagomorph to actually call or to vocalize. They produce a short call that sounds like this. And they um, live typically restricted to um, rock slides and boulder fields in high elevations. So 
This distribution is thought to be limited by both a sensitivity to high temperatures and a limited ability to disperse between different patches of habitats. So you can see this is sort of their patchy distribution across Western North America. Um, interestingly, like all lagomorphs, pikas are physiologically incapable of hibernating. So, um, th and there's not a lot of snow, or there's, there's not a lot of snow, there's not a lot of food available um, when there is a lot of snow uh, that covers their habitat. And so what they do to be able to survive and be awake through the winter is they stockpile a lot of food during the summer. So a single pica makes a big food cache. It's called a hay pile. So here's a picture of a hay pile, and this is the pica right here for comparison. Um, a, they, a single pica can actually produce a 28 kilogram hay pile. So that's like 65 pounds of vegetation. Um, keep in mind that pikas are about the size and shape of a russet potato. And, um, <laughs> and so this is a tremendous summer investment. Um, it takes about 13,000 different hay trips, and if you were to scale this to a human size, um, uh, it would be like us amassing over 5,000 pounds of food without even counting all of the packaging that our food comes in. And on each of our hay trips to the grocery store, we would be carrying home the equivalent of four heads of lettuce in our mouths. So the next time you guys are at the grocery store, I invite you to spend a few minutes looking at the potatoes and then looking at the heads of lettuce. And um, hopefully that will give you a little bit of, a, of an appreciation for how much work Pike has put into um, collecting all of this food. Now, pikas, I mentioned that pikas have garnered a bit of a reputation for being a canary in the coal mine as a result for climate change. And part of that um, reputation stems from work that's been done in the Great Basin of Western North America. So one of my collaborators, Eric Beaver, um, went out and resurveyed a number of historical sites. Each of these sites is a place where we have historical records of pikas. So this could be a vouchered museum specimen or some other kind of like GPS referenced um, location from the last hundred years. And um, essentially what he did is then go back and say, are there still pikas at each of these sites? And if not, why not? Um, what he found is that about 40% of the sites, the pikas have gone locally extinct. And those sites that, were, that went extinct tended to be, um, have warmer summers and tended to have a reduced winter snowpack. And so this has led to the development of a couple of um, leading hypotheses about how climate change might affect pikas. Um, if we see changes in temperature and precipitation, and particularly those warmer summers, we know that pikas are um, sensitive to heat, but they won't just sort of like run around and be like, I'm too hot, I'm too hot, I'm dead, right? Um, what they'll do instead is they'll actually restrict their behavior um, during the summer, and so they're less active during the summer, which means that they probably aren't amassing those large winter food caches that they're gonna need to survive the winter, and that can lead to overwinter mortality. Um, Conversely, uh, if the snowpack is actually reduced in the mountains, um, the snowpack actually acts like a layer of insulation for the pikas. So I don't know about you guys, I was up there skiing today. I can tell you that at the top of Loge Peak, it felt significantly colder than 32 degrees out there today. Um, and, but if you were a pika underneath all of the snow that they have and the snow that they're getting up there right now, um, that layer, thick layer of snow actually keeps the temperature in the rocks where the pikas are very close to 32 degrees um, Fahrenheit, so very close to the freezing point. Now, when you remove that snow, it, ironically, the pikas are actually exposed to colder temperatures over the winter. And so um, this, this could potentially be kind of a double whammy where they are exposed to colder temperatures with less snow, especially that early season snowpack, and then they don't have as much food to survive the winter as well. So given all of these um, restrictions, this is you know, sort of a picture of where we would typically find pika habitat, especially around here. This is up Castle Creek. Um, from a hike that I did a couple of years ago. And um, we find pikas in this area up, you know, between about 10,000 and 14,000 feet. I've heard them at the top of 14ers before. Um, you know, and I'm like, what are you eating up here? <laughs> There's like no food. Um, <laughs> if only they would answer me back, my life would be so much easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> But where I was working um, before I moved here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, we find this typical habitat also in sort of alpine zones near tree line on the big cascade volcanoes like Mount Hood. So here you see a nice rock slide. There's lots of, of meadow vegetation near the rock slide for the pikas to eat. 
And um, you'll notice that these are much lower elevations, but this is primarily because um, this is such, so much further north. So we find the pika is near treeline um, at about, about 5,500 feet. Now, surprisingly, when I first started my PhD, there was uh, only a couple of, of people had noted this in the literature, but there actually are pikas that also survive at exceedingly low elevations in the Columbia River Gorge. So there have been detections of pikas as low as about 150 feet above sea level, and these pikas are persisting in a climate that is, seems to be totally unsuitable for them based on what we know about their sensitivity to temperature and precipitation. This is a place with a really long, hot summer, and it's a place that gets very little overwinter snowpack and has frequent freezing rain events. Um, so this was one of the central questions of my dissertation, was actually how are the pikas able to survive in this low elevation habitat? My hair. <laughs> Sorry for the viewers out there on YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so um, the stretch of the Columbia River Gorge where we find pikas is actually characterized by this sort of lush, temperate rainforest. Um, lots of Douglas fir in here, lots of ferns, lots of mosses. And it's punctuated by these rock slides that sort of open up. The forest opens up, and you see this, this um, talus field. Um, when I first, there's a lot of talus fields actually that I didn't even recognize necessarily as talus. They just looked like sort of bumpy moss. Um, but it turns out that there's lots of holes in here and the pikas are actually living in this habitat. And so again, this was one of the central questions of my dissertation was what exactly are the pikas doing there? Um, I amassed a large team of, of students and we set out and we conducted over 400 hours of behavioral observations. So we just, you know, sat on a rock. I typically had a thermos of hot coffee with me too, and um, watched the pikas and, and watched what they were doing. We watched um, what they were eating and we watched when are they active and when are they restricting their activity. One of the sort of surprising things that we found is that the pikas in this habitat were relying really heavily on moss as a food resource. So you're looking here at the diet breakdown of 17 different animals at two different sites. And what you can see is that in both cases, moss represents nearly 60% of the diet in, at both sites. And in contrast, their sort of typical food resources of grasses and wildflowers um, represent less than a quarter of the diet at each site. Now, this is really surprising because basically nobody eats moss. It has like the nutritional consistency of a cardboard box. So again, when you're in the grocery store, consider looking at eating the cereal box instead of the cereal, and that's what the, essentially the pikas are doing when they're eating this moss. Um, we did, though, collect, you know, I, I had a, a fellow graduate student in the lab who was studying gut microbes and how they might help mammals to digest plants, and he was like, why don't you collect some poop and bring it back? And so I did. And um, he actually did some, some genomic sequencing of the different um, bacterial strains that were present in the pica scat. And what we found was um, actually pretty interesting. Um, there's a group of bacteria known as melanobacteria, and melanobacteria are typically a really rare species in, in the gut microbes of, of mammals, but they have been implicated before in helping other mammalian herbivores to break down really high fiber diets. And what we found is that actually these moss-feeding pikas in Oregon had nearly 4% of their gut microbiome made up by this melanobacteria. Um, this was significantly more of this particular kind of bacteria than just typical feeding pikas from the Oregon sites or compared to pikas from other states, including Colorado. We had some samples from the Front Range and some samples from near Crested Butte uh, and other mammalian herbivores. So this suggests that um, pikas may have been getting some, some help from their special friends uh, in their guts to be able to eat, consume this really low um, nutrition diet. But when you think about it, you know, they're, they're basically, by being able to eat this moss, it, they're basically like living in a hay pile that required no energy to construct and that was available year round. So they may get, gain some other benefits from eating the moss um, aside from the fact that it's not a super nutritious food. So another thing that we did when we were trying to understand pikas in this habitat is we placed temperature sensors um, all over the place to sort of understand what kind of microclimates were we dealing with here. And so what we found on this front was also really surprising. 
Um, we are looking at here is a time trace of temperatures from uh, across a week of August during the summer. And this yellow line represents the ambient temperatures. So this is measured like it would be at a weather station. This is basically the temperature that you or I would be experiencing if we were out there hiking. And you can see that we've got, you know, sort of lows in the in around 15 degrees Celsius, highs uh, above 30 degrees Celsius. So this is a pretty warm summer day um, somewhere in the 80s. Um, in contrast, when we look at the temperatures during this same week that are measured about three weeks below, or sorry, three feet below the surface of the rocks, what we find is a really different story. Um, this, this about three feet below the rocks, what we found is that the temperature is pretty cool and pretty constant, very close to about six degrees Celsius. This is actually a temperature that like would be within the range of things that you would keep your refrigerator set at. So um, the, their pikas are basically living in a refrigerator. And on some of these warm summer days, this results in an instantaneous temperature disparity of over 30 degrees Celsius. So that's over 80 degrees different between the, um, the rock, what the pikas are experiencing down in the rocks and what they're experiencing at the surface. So in terms of how pikas are persisting in this atypical habitat, um, it seems like, you know, on one hand, they're consuming an unusual food resource. They've adjusted their diet in a behavioral way. And they're also seeking refuge in favorable microclimates. Um, another question that I sort of sought to, to understand was what happens when a species habitat is disturbed? And the question is really like, do they have to then go looking for new habitat or are they able to stay and make the most of what's left after a disturbance? Um, so this is the part of the evening where I give you the disclaimer that I never set off to be a fire ecologist, but I had a really unique opportunity to study this um, in 2011 through 2015. Um, what happened was that I had originally set up some study sites on the north face of Mount Hood, and these were close to um, Timberline and were supposed to serve as sort of a control sites for the Columbia River Gorge sites in, you know, more typical habitat. And uh, so this is a picture that I took uh, on August 24th. I had been out there with some students backpacking. We packed up all of our stuff, went back down. I sent my students home and I went to Portland and was hanging out at the brewery. And meanwhile, um, the, the, there was a big strike of lightning that ignited a big wildfire. Um, and this Dollar Lake fire burned um, across most of the north face of Mount Hood for uh, several weeks that year. Uh, and it included my study sites. <laughs> So when, um, when I came back in 2012, uh, I noticed, you know, I didn't even know that this had happened until I came back the following year. Um, what you can see is that this fire burned most of the north face of Mount Hood, and it left behind these vast swaths of basically total destruction, um, which encompassed some of the talus patches that had previously been home to pikas. So I arrived at my study sites and, you know, getting ready to do whatever it was that I was going to do. And, you know, they had all been kind of burnt to a crisp. And so I sat down and I cried and I was like, my thesis just went up in flames. I'm never going to graduate from graduate school. And, um, <laughs> but I came to actually realize that, that ultimately that a really interesting natural experiment had been created for me. And nobody had ever really studied how fire affects pikas, um, although this, their frequency and severity of wildfires are predicted to increase across the pikas range. So um, I sort of gathered up my field crew. We, we um, did some internet searching on how do you study fire. <laughs> and um, then we set back out again to answer some burning questions. <laughs> uh, it's the first time I've ever made that joke, guys. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so our first question was pretty basic. Um, could pikas even survive a wildfire? And um, then secondly, you know, given if they could, the question was really how does fire disturbance affect the habitat suitability for them? And specifically, when, at what point do we really see recolonization of this disturbed habitat? So in terms of this first question, um, again, this is, the, this is my study site at, at Pinnacle Ridge in August 24th of 2011, uh, three days before the Dollar Lake fire was ignited. And when we came back in 2012, notice a couple of really key landscape changes here. First of all, um, 
this whole row of trees, and in fact, all of the trees around this patch perimeter were all dead. So this fire was uh, had a 100% tree mortality in this area. And none of this sort of like low intensity, clear out the understory stuff, like total stand replacement. Um, the other thing that, that you might not be able to see here is that this is a, um, a big patch of bushes and shrubs. They're mostly rhododendrons. And um, these rhododendrons over here uh, in 2012 had been completely reduced to a pile of white ashes. And I came to learn that white ashes indicate exceedingly high um, fire temperatures, above 500 degrees Celsius. Another thing you may not quite be able to see in these pictures is my students that actually are marking my temperature sensors. So prior to the fire, we had placed out these same temperature sensors that we were using in the gorge in order to monitor um, microclimates on Mount Hood and also to be able to look at snowpack duration um, by looking at that, at that insulin, insulating capacity. Um, when we came back in 2012, to my sort of surprise, the temperature sensors were not only not melted, but in fact, they appeared to still be functioning. So this made me the first person to measure temperatures in the talus during a wildfire, um, to my knowledge. And so we eagerly got the temperature sensors, we downloaded the data, we brought them up on the computer at the coffee shop, and this is what we saw. Um, so, <laughs> what you're looking at here is, again, a time trace of temperatures um, from before, during, and after the fire. On the solid line is the temperature that was measured at the talus surface, and the dotted line is the temperature that was measured in the interstitial space, so about um, three feet below the surface of the talus. Now, if you're like me and you're looking at this, you might be wondering to yourself, self, where's the fire? <laughs> um, and in fact, that's exactly what I wondered to myself when I first looked at this. Um, I ended up being able to do a little bit of uh, digging around the fires incident management website and I found a, an infrared map that showed when different areas on, in the fire perimeter were zones of intense heat. And so it turns out that this area where these sensors were was a zone of intense heat um, during about three days here in September. So uh, apart from this little uptick of, of mid-afternoon or early evening temperatures um, during, during this time, there's a couple of things that I kind of want to point out to you. First is that the surface temperatures were not really that elevated compared to temperatures that the animals would have experienced before the fire. So they're well within the range of temperatures that they would have experienced um, without the fire. Secondly, the talus temperatures also never exceeded 20 degrees Celsius, which is well below our best estimate of heat stress in picas. So I think that I just want to point out one other thing here to you guys, just to like kind of send this, this point home. Um, here's the location of the sensors right here, big pile of white ashes, 500 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, like over the distance of like a couple of meters. So this to me suggested that, that at least if they were um, able to get under the rocks during the fire, at least with respect to temperature, the pikas probably could have survived. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any marked animals up there, and so I can't say for sure whether or not like specific animals survived the fire, um, but we can say that, that they were actually pretty widely distributed after the fire. So our second question was really, how does this fire disturbance affect the suitability of habitat for pikas? And along this line, one of the things that we were interested in was whether or not the fire might actually change the microclimates that the pikas would experience. We thought this might happen for two reasons. One, that the loss of canopy cover at some of these severely burned sites might allow more sunlight to hit the rock slide and might make the, the microclimates that the pikas are experiencing much warmer. Second is that in a lot of these severely burned sites, you'll see that actually the color of the rocks were changed. They were actually, the rocks themselves were charred. Um, might be little bits of like lichen and moss that, that burned that and, and sort of like ash and stuff that gave it that color. But in either case, we thought that there was a good chance that these darker colored rocks might absorb more sunlight and then would re-radiate that sunlight onto the pikas, um, raising the microclimate. So um, we set out and worked at 24 different talus patches that I'll refer to as sites. Um, we picked eight sites that were unburned. These had no evidence of any kind of burn vegetation within about 10 to 20 meters of the talus perimeter. And then the moderately burned and the severely burned sites were distinguished between um, by the 
percent of the linear patch perimeter that was burned and also by the canopy mortality within that burned perimeter. Um, we kept all of these sites north facing so that we wouldn't be affecting our microclimate measurements with the you know sort of north versus south facing sites but um, the severely burned sites were all kind of in the middle elevation because if you recall looking at that burn scar um, the fire sort of burned all of the north facing um, middle elevation of of mount hood Importantly, there was no difference in patch size between these three different site categories, suggesting that the fire didn't preferentially burn smaller or larger sites. And all of these sites had evidence of previous pica occupancy. So we know that at least in the recent past, these were all places that were previously suitable for pikas. So we placed temperature sensors um, at each of these sites. And for the purpose of the microclimate analysis, I'm going to combine the unburned and the moderately burned sites. The reason that I think I can do that is that these moderately burned sites had relatively little canopy loss, and they also did not experience the same kind of charred rock situation that the severely burned sites did. So we didn't expect that they would um, necessarily have that change in microclimate. Um, we then downloaded all of the data from all of the sensors that we collected, and we used the data to calculate several metrics of thermal stress in PICAs. And these are metrics that have been predictive of of pica occupancy in other studies. So we know pikas are sensitive to heat stress, and we could imagine that this heat stress could act either acutely through the number of very hot days or in a more chronic way through elevated average temperatures. Um, the same thing could be said for cold stress, that it could act acutely through the number of very cold days or chronically through colder winter temperatures. So remember that snowpack acts like a, an insulating blanket. If the sites that had been severely burned had a reduced winter snowpack, then we would expect that the pikas would have um, an increased exposure to these very cold temperatures. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm only going to show you the data for the acute heat stress, but know that all of these other metrics, both chronic heat stress and both of the cold stress metrics, actually showed the exact same pattern. So we would expect that, oops, there we go, um, that each of these metrics of stress would vary predictably with elevation. So here we are looking at on the x-axis is elevation in meters, um, and on the y-axis we're looking at the number of very hot days. Um, this probably makes intuitive sense to you guys, that as you go up in elevation, you experience fewer very um, hot days. So if we were to measure the temperature here in Aspen, where you guys live, and in Grand Junction, where I live, at a lower elevation, um, you guys will experience much cooler summers, which is why I like to come here. <laughs> um, I'm a pika too. <laughs> um, so indeed, this is what we found. Um, we did find evidence that, that there were fewer hot days at higher elevations. But importantly, what you see here is that these red dots represent the severely burned sites, the black dots represent the unburned and moderately burned sites, and the severely burned sites actually did not experience any more stress than we would expect just based on their elevation. Uh, we found the same thing for those chronic heat stress and for the, both all of the cold stress me metrics, that um, stress varies predictably with elevation, but the severely burned sites don't experience higher levels of stress than we would expect just based on elevation. So together, you know, we felt like we found very little evidence that the fire had any effect on the microclimates relevant to the pikas. But obviously, microclimate is only part of the habitat suitability issue. And when you look at a habitat like this, you know, one of the sort of first questions that you might think of is, what are they eating? And so um, to try and answer this question, we conducted pika abundance surveys. Um, so we walked transects across the talus and we noted the locations of pikas where we saw them or where we heard their calls. We also recorded the locations of um, fresh clippings or of fresh hay piles from this, this year's vegetation. And we used these data to estimate the number of animals at each site um, with the idea that a single individual doesn't necessarily represent a reproducing population. We also conducted vegetation surveys, and we did so non-destructively, which would allow us to repeatedly sample the same area from year to year so that we could actually see that vegetation recover. Um, we, to do that, essentially what we did is we estimated the total biomass of vegetation in, um, within a meter squared, and we did that at five different locations around each different talus patch. 
I also harness the remarkable renewable energy source of middle schoolers. Um, so they, I collaborated with a really cool charter middle school called Jane Goodall Environmental Middle School in Salem, Oregon. Um, they go by JGEMS, and um, all students at JGEMS actually have to conduct in their eighth grade year a original authentic field research project. And so for about four years, um, I had a new batch of eighth grade students that came out every year, and we surveyed the same three sites for their project. I taught them how to do all the same things, how to count the pikas, how to do the vegetation surveys, how to place the temperature sensors. And um, these data formed the basis of their research project. And then they also formed the, a part of my larger project on fire. All right, so um, when it came to the number of pikas that we found at each site, the burn severity status definitely made a, di a difference. So here you're looking at a time series. Um, each point represents the average number of pikas that we detected at sites that were that burn severity class. Um, what we can see from this graph is that over the course of the fire, um, in every season of sampling, the severely burned sites had fewer pikas on average than did the moderately burned sites or the unburned sites. Um, however, I want to point out a couple of, of kind of interesting and maybe more hopeful things. Um, first is that we did actually see a trend in the severely burned sites where um, the severely burned sites increased in abundance over the course of the study. The second thing that I want to point out is that in all of these sites, the abundance of pikas increased from spring to fall in each year. And this is consistent with patterns of recruitment in a reproducing population. Um, when we looked more into other kinds of habitat factors that were predictive of the number of pikas that we found at each site across burn severity status, uh, we found that uh, vegetation was a big one. So what you're looking at here on the x-axis, this is vegetation biomass in grams per meter squared. That's the average across those, four, those five different quadrats at each site. On the y-axis, you're looking at the pica abundance, so the number of picas that we counted at each site. Each point on this graph represents a single site in a single season of sampling. And the color of the point indicates the burn severity status. The shape of the point indicates the sampling period. What really sort of jumped out to me when I first looked at this graph was that there seems to be a, a vegetation threshold here. It's somewhere around 50 to 100 grams per meter squared. If we look at all of the sites that have more than that amount of vegetation, what we see is that there's very few unoccupied sites and that vegetation doesn't seem to have a big effect in this area on the number of pikas that we see. On the other hand, if we look at all of the sites that are, have less than this much vegetation, um, what we can see is that there's very few sites that have um, more than a single individual, um, which would be necessary for a reproducing population. Furthermore, we actually also saw um, recolonization of some of these severely burned sites when the vegetation biomass crossed this threshold. So just to give you a, an idea for what this looks like, this center quadrat here is a picture of a site that actually has 55 grams per meter squared. Um, it represents about enough food for uh, one pica for a couple of days. So um, kind of in summary here, during the fire, uh, we have some evidence that uh, talus microclimates remain quite cool. And after the fire, um, we didn't find any evidence that the severely burned sites were more thermally stressful, but we did find evidence that pikas were able to recolonize these severely burned areas once the vegetation was recovered. So, of course, all of these different conclusions may depend on the fire, as well as patch attributes like the um, complexity and the shape of the patch, as well as the prevailing climate and whether or not it's conducive for pikas to, to be able to disperse into burned areas. And so wouldn't you know it, I'm the luckiest person ever because I got another opportunity to study this. <laughs> um, so some of you guys may have been sitting there patiently wondering, you know, wanting to say, hey, Pika Joe, didn't the Columbia Gorge burn up too? Um, and the answer to your question is yes, it did um, in 2017. So this was the Eagle Creek fire. It burned uh, really most of the um, stretch of the Columbia Gorge that was home to pikas uh, in 2017 during the fall. This was a fire that was started by a teenager throwing fireworks off of a cliff into the bushes. I'm not really sure what he thought was going to happen there, but 
this is what happened. Um, and so we have um, been working to monitor the pikas after this fire. Um, one of the things that I can tell you is that this fire had really profound impact on the habitat structure, particularly with respect to the moss cover at some of these sites. So when um, we returned, um, I wasn't able to get in right after the fire. The Forest Service hadn't done their risk assessments, and so they didn't feel like it was safe. But when I did get in um, in June the following year, you could see that at some of these sites, this really lush, thick moss cover um, that had been there was really, really fragmented and very few places that still have that really thick moss, moss cover. Um, I can also tell you that some of my surface temperature sensors didn't fare so well this time around. So although I wasn't able to get any data off of this sensor, I can infer that the surface temperatures were at least the melting point of this plastic. Um, However, in spite of the fact that my surface sensors melted at this particular site, the talus sensor was still intact when I recovered it. And so again, eagerly went back to the same coffee shop, um, plugged it into the computer, downloaded the data, and um, was once again sort of surprised. So um, what you're looking at here, again, a time trace of temperatures from uh, before the fire. Um, I have pretty good social media records of when the, pica, the, when the fire reached this particular site, as I was following this very closely on Twitter while teaching my classes. And um, remember that before the fire, we had this really cool, stable, constant microclimate down in the rocks about six degrees. Um, when the fire hit uh, this particular site, we saw a really sharp increase in temperatures up to um, from about six degrees to about eight degrees Celsius. Um, so once again, this is still like a perfectly acceptable range of temperatures for your refrigerator to be in. Um, while this sensor was melting at the surface, um, anything that was living uh, you know, two to three feet below the surface would have still been exposed to this very, very cool, stable microclimate. Um, in terms of trying to understand how the pikas are recovering, um, we ended up, I've been a part of a, an organization called Cascades Pika Watch, which is run out of the Oregon Zoo for, um, since I started my PhD. And um, we applied for a, some funding for the, the U.S. Forest Service from their SITSI um, competitive funding program to study, uh, to engage citizen scientists in, in helping to monitor the recovery of the pikas in the gorge following this fire. So for the last two summers, I've gone out to the gorge for about a week and I've conducted somewhere between six and eight four hour field trainings, um, getting a group of 60 to 80 volunteers up to speed on a standardized protocol for estimating pika abundance. Um, and I just have to say my jokes got funnier every time, <laughs> or at least I thought, <laughs> um, which is what matters. Um, we're still working through some of these data, but um, in terms of occupancy rates, we can say that before the fire, the, um, we had 36 sites that we were able to resurvey after the fire. And these were sites that were accessible, that the Forest Service was gonna allow us to go to, and that we had volunteers who signed up to visit them. Um, so of those 36 sites before the fire, actually 84% of those sites were occupied. Um, following the fire, uh, the, we saw a pretty sharp decrease in the occupancy rate of, of these sites uh, by about half. Um, interestingly, of these sites, we had 16 sites that had previously had pikas where the pikas were no longer detected, but um, two sites where the pikas previously had not been detected were colonized after the fire. Um, both of these sites were very small patches that had a very high amount of unburned moss cover, which I think kind of highlights the value of that moss both for um, insulation and also for a um, food resource. So we're still working on, on sort of disentangling what exactly is going on here. But um, if you compare this with the, the sites on Mount Hood, where every single site was occupied within a couple of years of the, of the fire, uh, we do see a much sharper decrease in occupancy. So altogether, I think that this work makes a couple of important implications or contributions toward understanding how pikas may cope with a changing climate. Um, first of all, we learned that talus is actually a very good thermal refuge. So I always tell people, and don't take this as like actual like advice, survival advice, <laughs> but if I get stuck in a wildfire, I'm gonna go in the rocks <laughs> um, because I've now measured it twice and it doesn't get that hot. Um, the 
second thing that was important about this is some of the conservation implications of this vegetation threshold. That um, having an idea of some of the fundamental habitat requirements for the species and when they're able to recolonize a like really disturbed habitat um, provides us with kind of a tractable conservation and management objective and also tells us a little bit about some of the sort of um, fundamental things that need to be conserved for a habitat to be suitable for pikas. So what I want to do now is kind of wrap up um, some of the lessons that we've learned from this study, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the current research that I'm doing here in Colorado. So first thing um, about sort of how we can use data like these to improve ecological forecasting is that I think this, these studies really highlight the need to identify habitat features that buffer those microclimates from the ambient temperatures. And in both of the habitats that I've told you about tonight, the Columbia River Gorge and the disturbed habitat, we have many such features. Um, we know that the forest canopy cover in, in the Columbia Gorge, at least before the fire, was um, really important in, in reducing the amount of sunlight that hits the rock slide. And in both of these cases, because they're in the Pacific Northwest, have relatively high humidity and precipitation. Um, this is both facilitates pica dispersal between patches of habitat, but also can affect the quality of vegetation that regrows at the sites. We also know that the moss cover seemed to be really important at, at the Columbia Gorge site. And we have some evidence that there may be some kind of subsurface water or ice features under these sites that are helping to moderate the microclimates. Um, a similar type of subsurface water and ice can be found here in the mountains around Aspen. Um, this is a picture of Capitol Peak from the backside of Avalanche Creek uh, from a run that I did a couple of years ago. And you can see here that there are um, these sort of like bumpy little bits of, of rock along the mountain are uh, actually features that typically are called rock glaciers. Um, they're thought to have this shape because of subsurface water and ice features. And a study that I did a couple of years ago with a collaborator from CU Boulder suggested that pikas that live in association with these rock glaciers experience lower levels of physiological stress than those that live um, away from subsurface water and ice, suggesting that this may be a really important habitat component in this kind of habitat, as well as in the Columbia River Gorge. Um, secondly, I think that this study really highlights the, the importance of selecting climate at an appropriate scale. And the appropriate scale at which you can sort of select the, the temperature data that you're going to use to look at, at species distributions um, can depend both on the habitat and sort of in terms of like how spatially variable are the microclimates that are available to an animal, and also the size and mobility of the organism. So how quickly can it shuttle between different types of microhabitats within an ecosystem? Um, just as a side note, this is a picture that I took of a pika at North Pole Basin, which is sort of just outside Crested Butte, um, just above Crystal, so not far from here. Um, and this is a study that, um, something that I'm trying to get at with a, a long-term demographic study that I'm working on with some collaborators. So um, we are here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, I have started working here in the LaSalle Mountains just across the border into Utah. And I have collaborators working at Rocky Mountain Biological Lab outside of Crested Butte and at the Niwot Ridge Ecological Field Station outside of Boulder. And at all three of these locations, we are trapping pikas, we're putting in these unique colored ear tags, and we're also placing temperature sensors actually within the focal territory of that pika. And what this will allow us to do is to be able to understand how, how and whether um, like the microclimate temperatures at the territory level are predictive of survival for, for pikas, both over winter and over summer. Um, we can also look at their, their health and body condition and what exactly they're eating and how much food they're collecting um, as predictors of survival as well. Finally, the vegetation um, availability you know, really highlighted this importance of including species interactions in these kinds of models. And this is something that I'm looking at with a former student of mine, Zoe Carnes Douglas, and my collaborator, Chris Ray. We're actually looking at changes in the nutritional quality of pika diet over three decades of climate change. Um, and this is something that's being done in Iwat Ridge, Colorado. I um, don't have time to tell you much more about this tonight, but if you're interested in it, I'm totally happy to talk about it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Stay tuned. So um, I kind of want to wrap up tonight by talking a little bit about how we can improve public interfacing about climate change. 
Um, there are lots of journalists that have already started calling today's world a post-truth era. And given the power of fake news to circulate through social media, um, it can be difficult for people to sort fact from fiction. Um, in general, though, we humans use five different sources of evidence in the pursuit of truth. And um, we may find that some people tend to rely more heavily on certain sources of evidence, such as authority. Um, but as a scientist, I feel really like a personal mission to sort of double down on our trust in scientific knowledge. And I've been doing that by trying to give people personal experience with scientific inquiry through the process of citizen science. So um, as was mentioned, I have been involved with several different citizen science projects, and I've told you a little bit about the Cascades PICA Watch one. But um, since moving to Colorado, I also have been involved with the Front Range PICA project, which some of you guys may have heard of and some of you guys may have even participated in. Um, the Front Range PICA project is a partnership between Rocky Mountain Wild and the Denver Zoo. And this past year, we received a, a grant to be able to expand into the White River National Forest. Um, and have had some super awesome partners in this respect, particularly the Independence Pass Foundation and Wilderness Workshop um, that have really helped a lot with a lot of the logistics. Um, this is a map showing you the distribution of the sites that we've added to this project. So we're here in Aspen. And you can see that we've got um, sites that sort of surround the whole Roaring Fork Valley um, going over into Vail and then a couple of sites up here in the flat tops as well. And um, so at each of these sites, we've had uh, volunteers go and visit. And um, in 2019, last summer, we actually had uh, 222 volunteers who surveyed 103 different sites across the, across the state. Uh, this is like a 180% increase in volunteers from previous years. So we're super stoked, but we still need help. Um, Good news for right now is that actually of these sites where we have historical records, we're seeing relatively high occupancy rates. So about 89% of these historically occupied sites are still occupied by PICAs. Um, compare that to 60% of occupied sites that are still occupied by PICAs in the Great Basin. Um, another thing that we're doing that's relatively new is that we're actually asking volunteers to collect fresh scat if they come across it. Um, pikas make the cutest poops. They look just like a little pile of peppercorns. Um, and so you just like, you know, put them into a tube. And then we have a party at the end of the year and you bring your poop and exchange it for tacos. <laughs> it's a great deal. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the <laughs> folks who collected scat, that scat is actually going to be um, uh, analyzed in the lab this winter for stress hormone metabolites and so that we can actually look at the physiological condition of the pikas at some of these sites. Um, in addition, one other thing that I think is really interesting about this project is that um, we, the data from this project were actually used in uh, an analysis that came out last year. This was published ooh, in Nature Climate Change, um, which is a pretty high impact um, journal. And it was an analysis from across the range of how pikas are responding to climate change. Um, I think that this was a really nice example of how the pika research and citizen science communities really came together and shared data in a way that we assembled a, a super massive data set. Um, there's very few species on Earth that have this kind of comprehensive data set, let alone have scientists and citizen science groups that are all willing to play it in the same sandbox together and like work with each other. <laughs> so um, I think it was a really neat effort that the Front Range PICA project got to be a part of. Um, you guys got a sneak preview of this. <laughs> that um, We also have some survey evidence that participating in this project and is really beneficial for volunteers and has a, a, a positive effect on their sense of environmental stewardship. Um, specifically, volunteers were, felt that they um, gained a better understanding of climate change and of pika ecology, that they were likely to talk to their friends and families about pikas, and that they might also take personal steps to reduce their own emissions or donate to conservation. Um, so I sort of in conclusion here want to highlight that citizen science can have a lot of broader impacts as well. Um, by working in a project like ours, um, participants get to interact really closely with scientists and they get to know an actual living scientist. This is a hashtag that circulated on social media over the last couple of years when it became obvious that most people cannot name an actual living scientist. Most people when asked to name a scientist say Albert Einstein and he's dead. Um, so <laughs> uh, that I think is a nice benefit.
Um, in addition, there is some evidence, this is a nice paper that came out a couple of years ago, that uh, people with increased levels of scientific curiosity may be more likely to also listen to and respect political views that are different from their own, um, suggesting that this kind of activity may help bring people together. And finally, um, I want to end with this idea that participating in a project like this can contribute new perspectives. So there are a lot of different lines of research that I have been involved in and that I've been fortunate enough to be involved in that are the direct result of ideas from citizen scientist volunteers. Um, they think about things in a different way than, than I might and um, have lots of sort of fresh perspectives and um, new ideas that I would not have considered. So if any of this sounds like fun to you, um, especially the part where you exchange poop for tacos, um, <laughs> you should join us. We are always looking for more volunteers. Uh, if you check out our website, picapartners.org, um, there's a big button right at the front at the top that says join us. And um, what you do is there's a little form and you give us some data on yourself, like your phone number and your um, email address. And then we'll reach out with um, training opportunities in the spring. Um, we are also working on an opportunistic survey app to allow collection of data. So if you're just out there hiking during the summer and you see a pika, um, this app would allow you to report it without having to go to a bunch of trainings or like commit to a bunch of arduous um, field work. So we're doing beta testing on that this winter and hope to have that ready for you guys in the, fall, in the spring. Um, so with that, I have many, many, many people to thank. Um, I can't read all of their names, but I've worked with some really wonderful collaborators and mentors. I've had some really super fantastic field assistants and students and um, have convinced a large number of people to pay me to do things for fun that I would do for fun anyway, <laughs> which is to go hiking and watch pikas. Um, so thank you to all of them too. I promise I'm making good use of their money. So um, <laughs> with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, whenever we have time for. Thank you. So with the the like looking at extant versus extinct sites, how do you say that yeah. pikas aren't in a place? Yeah, good question. It's a lot harder to say that they are not in a place than to say that they are in a place, right? Um, and typically what we have to do is um, validate several different resurveys. We make sure that we're surveying at an appropriate time of day uh, so that the pikas are really active, likely to be active if they're there, and that we have um, multiple different teams go and say that they failed to detect pikas. Um, the good news is that among species Pikas actually have a really high detectability, which means that if they are, that has been estimated at like 90 to 95%. And so what that means is that if they are there and you know what you're looking for, then you are 90 to 95% likely to detect them by some way. And the, the hay piles are really helpful with that because even if you don't actually see or hear them, you can find evidence that doesn't run away when it gets hot. Yeah. In the back. <laughs> um, I was curious about uh, population exchange and if there was a difference between typical sites like here in Colorado and atypical sites like out in Oregon. Yeah, so um, if I understand your question right, you're asking about like how individuals move between different populations. Um, that's a great question. Um, there are some people who are starting to be able to answer that with genetics. So you can collect hair um, non-invasively. You just put up like pieces of tape around the hay pile and the pica crashes through it and then you get hair and you can get DNA that way. And so there are some people who have started to look at like how much like population and gene flow occurs in different populations. Um, I know that in the Columbia River Gorge, we do see some evidence of like restricted dispersal, even though they're living in this sort of, I call it a magical pika paradise. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I would expect that um, that's probably a bigger issue in like, if you think about as sort of like a mainland habitat versus isolated habitat. So like these places in the Great Basin, they're like little tiny mountain ranges surrounded by sagebrush desert in all directions for 80 miles. So ain't no pikas moving on and off those mountain ranges, right? Um, and so that's probably a bigger deal than, than um, in, in those kinds of places than what we would have in a place like this, where you've got a, a lot of high elevation habitat that's well connected. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so now you, you talked about some of the the difference of volume of vegetation in the different fire sites. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was different kinds of vegetation that came back, if you saw differences in what the pike were gathering and what grew back in different sites. Yeah, so um, we looked at that and there were n we, we didn't find any evidence that pika abundance was tied to any certain kind of vegetation. It just seemed to be like the total amount. And this kind of makes sense. Pikas are generally considered to be generalist herbivores, which means that they can eat a little bit of everything, um, but they tend not to specialize on any one thing. And so to me, I sort of interpreted that as that once they got enough plants back, they were like, it's cool, we'll eat whatever, there just needs to be enough food, um, but weren't super picky about any one particular plant. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that's the same story in the Columbia Gorge with the moss, or if they you know, potentially shift their diet. <laughs> I think this might be our last question. <laughs> uh, kind of on the same note as that last question, you had a plotter graph that was number of picas versus biomass per meter squared. Right. Um, and there was like one outlier kind of mm -hmm. at the top right. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like that was below the threshold then on the next slide of how much biomass they needed per meter squared. Let me pull that it's back up just so that we can have an informed discussion about it. <laughs> So that are you one. talking about this guy? Yeah. And okay. so, and then I think the next slide said it was 53. Um, 55. 55. So that's below the, the threshold. Does that mean that they just have better, you know, quality biomass there? Or is that they um, thrive in communities? Or? Th this guy actually is, has a lot of vegetation. So this, the, the position on this x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the vegetation biomass at that site. And so this site actually here is closer to like 550 grams oh. per meter squared. So this one actually had like one of the super, a lot of vegetation um, at that site. Um, the threshold is like though, I, I think a little bit of kind of a like rule of thumb kind of situation. So you can see, for example, here's an unoccupied site that's a really burned site that has, that's above the threshold. And here are three sites that were, you know, had two pikas that are well below that threshold. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, something that fell out of the data, but I don't see as being like a hard fast, like the pikas sort of come there and they're like, huh, 50. <laughs> I, this is, you know, the slums, right? <laughs> um, so does that answer your question? Totally. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll do one more. <laughs> Um, I was curious about the gut bacteria. That yes. was really fascinating to me, and I was um, really interested in where is that gut bacteria coming from? Is it uh, diet? Is it genetic? Or I was thinking carpophagy, maybe? They're the young eating their mom's fecal matter? Yes. Um, all of those things are possibilities. So um, we didn't do anything in this study that would like potentially get at that mechanism for pikas, but more broadly, um, the ways that mammals acquire gut microbes is through the birthing process from, from mom, um, through like the eating microbes out there in the world typically, or um, by coprophagy, which is just a fancy word for eating poop. <laughs> so pikas, like all lagomorphs, eat their own poop. They produce a special kind of poop. It's called a cecal pellet. It's highly nutritious. It's six times more nutritious than the moss that they're eating. And they sometimes eat it fresh right away. And sometimes they store it for a tasty snack for later. Um, so, uh, and they do also sometimes collect and store poop from other species. So I have found pika hay piles that have marmot poop in them, and the pikas are like going to the marmot den and stealing their poop <laughs> for later. So um, those are all potential routes that they could have gotten that, the, those gut microbes. And then, you know, once the, it, the population is sort of enriched in that, it can be sort of self-sustaining through those same, those same routes. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you. so much, Joe. <laughs>